Doug, my guy. How we doing tonight? How's everything? Man, bless black and highly favored. How you feeling, right. brother? I'm feeling just the same. Now, Invisible Generals, uh, this book was partially inspired by you going to see Red Tails. Yeah. And you hated it. Uh, I, well, when I went to go see a screening for Red Tails, uh, the main character in the movie, who was played by Terrence Howard, uh, is actually like the patriarch and center of our family. So when he came out and his name was changed, mm -hmm. uh, I got really upset about it. I went home and I talked to my dad about it, and he said, Doug, if you think changing a name in a movie is bad, let me tell you the family story to let you know how I lived, and then maybe you could see why that doesn't mean as much to me as it means to you. And he shared with me the family story of wow. the Invisible Generals. Um, and that's what was the impetus for me to write my book. Tell us, tell us who the Invisible Generals are. So the Invisible Generals are America's first two black generals, uh, a father and a son, General Benjamin O. Davis Sr. and General Benjamin O. Davis Jr. And these two men at the start of World War II were the only two black officers in the whole United States military out of wow. 335,000 people. And they worked together to help desegregate the military, create the Tuskegee Airmen, and so many more things. Mm -hmm. But their story had never been told, and it was my passion to go out and write it. That's right. Why? Going back to Red Tails for a second, why do you think a lot of military movies struggle with getting the history right? I think um, the challenge with Red Tails is that when people look at it, they feel that it's true American history, but it's actually just the facade of that. It actually is an amalgamation of the stories. Mm -hmm. And um, not paying the families and using different fictional names allows you to have a little bit more with the storytelling. Mm -hmm. But then the families feel a certain way because this is how people recognize the story, yet the families aren't compensated and the stories that are actually happening are never really told. So it's just a way uh, to not pay y'all, basically. Yeah, 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 it's a way to not pay us. <laughs> did, 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 did George Lucas or the writer interview you or other family members when crafting the story? No, some other Tuskegee Airmen were contacted, but my family in particular was not contacted, mm -hmm. which I thought, you know, as the commander and the creators of the Tuskegee Airmen, um, I thought that there would be a little bit more um, you know, effort to go reach out to the family, but yeah. that wasn't the case in this movie. Why do you think Hollywood likes to gloss over the real stories of African Americans in the military? Like, don't get me wrong, I love movies like Major Pain, but I'm sure there was like, <laughs> I'm sure yeah, there's like a real a black major story <laughs> that, 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 kicked, that was ignored. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the biggest challenge with this is uh, I think the people that are the decision makers have a certain narrative or a certain a formula that works really well for them. But if you ask me, the story of the Tuskegee Airmen and particularly the Invisible Generals uh, is one of the greatest American stories ever told. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to encourage people to go out and actually get their own family stories and talk to the individuals on the couch That's and right. say, tell me what happened. And then also take the effort to write the narrative because whoever writes the narrative or photographs the narrative owns the copyright. Oh. So if it's not the family learning, and this is what I want to tell all veterans and all family of veterans, your story is in the public domain. You don't actually control it or own it. If a journalist tells it what? and writes it, they take control of the narrative. So it was important for me as a family member to say, I am going to take control of this narrative and I am going to write it so the actual words and history that happened can be told in an accurate way. Wow. Um, yeah. A lot of people... A lot of people think movies and books like this glorify war, but how do the stories of veterans do the opposite? Actually, the stories of veterans are really stories of leadership and mm -hmm. stories of the United States of America. I think we need to look more as what defines an American, not always chop it up into different subsets, but actually look at these as American stories. Um, and then I think when we have that set, then we can look at these stories as a way to unify. I think leadership is an important quality that all veterans have. Mm -hmm. And many veterans go on to work in the private sector, but we don't talk about their military service. You know, Coach K graduated from West Point, but you think of him as the coach of Duke basketball. You don't look at him as a veteran. Oh, and, that's uh, probably why he, yeah, he learned how to be such a disciplinarian. Exactly, yeah, and that's yeah. why his leadership was taken from what he learned at the academy. So it's important to realize a lot of veterans aren't, you know, walking around in fatigue they're actually everyday people, CEOs, 
people that spent time supporting their country, and now is their opportunity to do it in the private sector. Uh, in the book, you tell the story of getting West Point to name their new barracks after your great uncle Ben, mm -hmm. and that happened around the same time people started tearing down Confederate statues. Do you think that movement had an impact on getting the military to honor uh, Ben? I do. I actually think that was a very unique moment in time where there was a lot of statues coming down, um, particularly of um, Lee. So that was the person who was kind of the center point of it, Robert E. Lee. And during... They knew you weren't talking about Lee Daniels. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like Robert... <laughs> Robert E. Lee, yeah. <laughs> Lee Daniels, yeah, of yeah. course. <laughs> but Robert E. Lee had the statues, and this was a unique opportunity because West Point at that time had nothing named after mm -hmm. a black graduate. So this was a chance for them to... They were building their biggest, largest barrack. There was three names up for consideration. And when I went and told them the story of the Invisible Generals as I had researched it, they named the building after him, and it's the largest barracks on the middle center of the West Point campus. Wow, 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 wow. wow. Now, this is interesting. After your grandfather served, he worked for the Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. and he basically created the speed limit? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, a actually, this is a great story. So, after he left the military in, in uh, 1970, uh, he worked for the Department of Transportation, and in that role, he created... Uh, the TSA, what became the TSA Airport Security. He created the United States Air Marshal Program to keep the sky safe. And they, he was so successful <laughs> wow. that they asked him to do it for transportation, not aviation. And that's where he led the creation of the 55 mile an hour speed limit. So these were all created by one guy and we don't even know who he is, is impossible for me to comprehend. The speed limit and the TSA? Yeah. Well, what is now known as the TSA? Yeah, what is yeah. it called back then? Did they even have a name for it? Security. Security. <laughs> <laughs> Should there be more outreach to servicemen and women of color now to encourage them to write and tell their own stories to make sure their stories aren't lost? Yeah, I think every single veteran, and, and, and even if you're not a veteran, if there's a veteran in your family, or even if you have someone in your couch who wasn't serving but lived a really different life, we should go and ask our ancestors and our relatives, you know, what did you go through and what are their stories? Legacy is so important. Man. We are driven by the generational collateral that our families laid out before us, but we don't even know what that is. The greatest stories in America are sitting on our couches. The greatest stories in America could be from families of veterans. I didn't serve, but it's so important that we take this time because we only have so much time and we take the stories from our family, we own the stories from our family, and we put them down on paper so our legacy can be preserved in an accurate way. Man, what you're saying is so true, man. And, and, and you make me think, like, you, you make me think that, sadly, a lot of our great stories are, are you know, homeless, you know, sitting on the corner yeah, our stories asking us for change while yeah. they're holding up a, a, a sign telling us that they fought in the war, which pisses me off. I hate how this country treats its veterans, man. Yeah, and we could do a lot more for the veterans, and it's everyday things, you know, going to read to veterans, donating time, but also money, grants. There's so many things we could do, but it starts with first knowing your legacy and knowing the stories of the people in your living room and then going ahead and saying, how can I now take my generational collateral and add to the narrative and help others like they helped us? Oh, let's expound on that just a little. Veterans Day is coming up. Yep, uh, Veterans Day comes to 11-11. Yep. 11-11 at 1-11. How do you think we could best memorialize and celebrate these heroes? I think the best thing we can do for Veterans Day to start off, visit a museum, go support a VA, go to a VFW, which is a veteran of foreign war outpost, do something that you can do to lend a helping hand. If you don't have the money, dedicate your time. If you don't have the time, let your staff off so they can spend their time. But there's always something more we can do, and it's the least we can do for people who fought for the United States of America. That's right, man. man. Um, invisible generals. Full disclosure, I have a book in print called Black Privilege Publishing with Simon and & Schuster, and I'm happy to help Doug Melville uh, tell this story. So it comes out November 7th, and it's available to pre-order now.